Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Patrice Petro and I'm the director of the Carsey Wolf Center. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our center's first of three research roundtables this February that are a part of a larger series dedicated to media, technology, and politics under pressure. Today's session explores the theme of 1920-2020. The aim here is to reflect on the historical and material dimensions of cinematic and public spaces, changes to both after the 1918 pandemic, and the implications of this history for understanding our current time. Four scholars that will join me today have been writing and thinking about a new kind of cinema history, one that lays claim to both historiography and to theory. As Jocelyn Sapaniak Galise and Stephen Gruning explain in their 2016 article, and I quote, film studies generally accepts its ties to ambiguity and paradox. It too frequently ignores cinema's physical excess, the spaces of exhibition where image and sound meet the messiness of the world. That particular moment of encounter and the multiplicity of things therein that misshape, reenact, and reconsider the relationship between film and the spectator bear a historical and theoretical urgencies. As theorists of cinema, we insist, we insist that the untangling of relationships between objects, bodies, and images evince some of the most essential questions film theory seeks to address. As historians of cinema, we argue that the presence of these objects in cinematic spaces speaks to the discourse of ideal spectatorship. In other words, we can extrapolate what ex exhibitors, theater patrons, and film producers thought spectatorship should, could, or might be. The implications extend past the smaller niche of exhibition studies into film studies in general." End quote. In sum, the panelists gathered uh, for the roundtable today aim nothing less than to rethink film history within a broader architectural, technological, and infrastructural frame. With that said, I would like to invite the panelists to the screen and ask them to briefly introduce themselves and how the roundtable theme intersects with their own research. Great. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much to Patrice Petro, to the Carsey Wolf Center at the University of California at Santa Barbara. I am Jocelyn Sapaniak Galise, and I'm an associate professor of English and Film Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, I'm an American film historian who focuses uh, generally on exhibition and on spectatorship from the late 1920s until around the 1960s. Um, I'm deeply invested in discourses that thread through the movie theater um, and through movies in American culture more broadly, um, threads that might appear invisible but are absolutely essential. Um, I'm always interested in how historical moments have shaped what seems natural or straightforward now, and thus how careful attention to micro histories and to archival documentation can offer insights into what our present practice is and, and you know, make things visible that maybe weren't quite visible before. So thanks so much for having me here. So thank you, Patrice, for organizing this panel and that wonderful introduction, and also that, that wonderful quotation that I've completely forgotten about <laughs> in the intervening years. Um, my name is Stephen Greening. I'm an associate professor of cinema and media studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I think of myself now as more of a media historian than a cinema historian. I've um, written quite a bit and published quite a bit on the history of in-flight entertainment, movies and television shows and other forms of entertainment on airplanes, um, thinking a lot about affect and different forms of spectatorship and cinema spectatorship outside of the theater, um, technologies such as headphones and how that um, changes our relationship to uh, moving images. Um, and my current project now is um, moving in a slightly different direction. I'm currently writing a book about television and philosophy, um, but maybe I'll weave that in somehow. I'll figure out a way. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie Hennefeld. And likewise, thank you again so much to Patrice and all of the organizers for putting together this wonderful roundtable and including me. I'm so delighted to be in conversation with Jocelyn, Brian, and Stephen. Um, I'm an associate professor of cultural studies and comparative literature at the University of Minnesota, uh, zooming in currently from the very cold and snowy Twin Cities. Um, 
And my work focuses uh, more on pre-2020 cinema, early film archives, um, slapstick comedy, the gender politics of laughter and feminist theory, though I have to reveal, I did wear my Louise Brooks dangly earrings for the panel, but to stay on topic for 1920. Um, and I'm broadly interested in the affective politics of film spectatorship and laughter in particular. Um, so I'm currently, my, my first book is on slapstick comedians in silent cinema. If it's not too cheesy to flash my book cover in front of the webcam, we're all kind of ghostly floating heads these days via Zoom, much like Florence Turner as Daisy Doodad. And I'm currently working on a project about um, female hysteria, early cinema, and women who allegedly died from laughing too hard. Um, and co-curating a DVD set on cinema's first nasty women with Laura Horak and Alif Rangan Kainachi, which will be out with Kino Lorber hopefully next year. So thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Brian Jacobson. I am professor of visual culture at the California Institute of Technology, zooming in from my office in Pasadena. If, uh, if you could see the other side of my screen, you would see that I'm looking out uh, at a very warm and sunny afternoon. Uh, I want to thank also uh, Patrice for inviting me and the Corsi Wolf Center and also my co-panelists. Uh, it's very exciting to be with you. Um, I come at this from an interest not so much in, the, uh, in the, the theater space, but rather in the behind the scenes, the messy world of the architecture and labor practices of the studios. Uh, I wrote a book about early film studio architecture in the US and France, and then I edited a book uh, that came out last year with California called In the Studio that looks at studios in a much longer historical trajectory up to the present uh, around the world. And so my interest here really is in um, how contagion um, intersects with working bodies and working practices in studios historically in the, in the 1910s, but also right now and, and the, the very real dangers that people are facing in their jobs here in, in LA and in other places. And hopefully we'll get to that. So thanks very much. Great. Well, in preparation for this roundtable, I ask that each of you share an article of your own or an archival document that you find particularly germane to our theme. Uh, could you each say what article or document you selected and why? And we can go in the same order that we just did just to start. And for the audience, these documents are available on our website if you want to look at them after the webinar, of course. Yeah, so I chose a couple articles from Motion Picture Herald in uh, 1932 and 1933. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. First of all, I am an enormous fan of industrial publications. Uh, so much of my work is based in industrial publications. The kind of stuff that people think is utterly freaking boring, I absolutely just eat up. Um, so I'm a huge fan of looking through Motion Picture Herald and getting a sense of you know, what was happening at the time and what, um, what exhibitors were really thinking and often they just use the most fabulous slang you can imagine. Um, but what they also do is enable us to understand different time periods on the ground, even in terms of things like humor, right? Like how were people making jokes at this particular point in time? What kind of jokes are being made? Um, but I'm particularly interested, like Brian, right now in this question of labor, because during the pandemic, labor has really come up to the surface. Now, it's, it's always been there, obviously, but I think we've really been thinking about that a lot. And I recently heard uh, Ramin Barani talking on NPR about his newest film. And he said that uh, it's a film that's about servants. And he said he was, ordering, uh, he was ordering delivery from Seamless on his phone while he's editing this film. And he said, it occurred to me that the iPhone is a directory of servants. And that really, really struck me because especially in this moment, it's been so easy to ignore the labor that is required to keep all of our lives going, to keep our educational systems going, um, and then to keep even just our, our food sources going, right? That, that's all been absolutely necessary, but in order for us to fully participate in it, it's like we have to ignore the labor in order to, um, in order to gain access to it. But I don't think this is actually something unique to the present moment. The dimensions of it are different because uh, they're, fun, they're uh, fueled by digitality, but it's not different. I think it's actually a way that Americans like to set up their perceptual environments. We really like things to be hidden. We like things to be convenient. Um, and we like to think about things one at a time. And that's maybe partially about the cult of American productivity, but film history is a really interesting place to think about this in particular. 
And that's because the movie theater in, in my book from 2018, I talk about how the movie theater tries to efface itself in order to privilege the film. But when that's effaced via illusion, so too is all of the labor that is put into that illusion. So when we as spectators go into the movie theater and only see the movie, we also don't see all the things that are happening behind the screen or behind the scenes. And that includes an entire cadre of workers who make everything seamless. And when the spate of union bombings happened in the early 1930s, it showed that what is made invisible cannot stay invisible forever. Right. Um, it means that the film industry is completely entangled with politics, with uh, the law, with all sorts of other forces and even actual forces, right, like mobs and mobsters in the end of prohibition. And we see that compared to today, how the pandemic has also brought the industry to its knees. But it's also revealed that we still think about low wage workers in the movie theater, ticket takers, ushers and janitors as disposable. And they are part of the seamlessness that makes up that illusion. But I think our job as film historians is actually to show the seams. Yeah, so um, <laughs> thank you, Jocelyn, that, that was great. Um, I. I kind of struggled with this actually a little bit when Patrice initially invited uh, me to participate in this roundtable and um, you know wrote a, a wonderful email about the theme and, and the kinds of issues that she was thinking of to organize this panel. I immediately thought of masks, and I thought of the masks that were um, used on the battlefield in World War One, which were basically modified versions of masks used by firefighters. And I have a feeling Brian's going to talk a little bit about fire um, within some time in the next hour or so, it will come up. Um, and the way that World War I sort of led to this um, maybe flood even of patents of gas masks in the United States, the um, 1918 flu pandemic um, that hit, of course, um, going through some of the local newspapers here in Seattle, you can see ads for masks being sold at local drugstores, um, various ointments and lotions and liquids that you can add to your mask um, to help prevent the spread of the flu. I was thinking about um, masks as media, the way that um, maybe they can send certain messages. I've got one here that's like a Miyazaki, a Miyazaki fandom mask to remind us all of the cuteness of my neighbor Totoro. Um, and to put us in a better mood. But, you know, uh, in 1925, Hugo Gernsbeck um, invented this uh, thing called the isolator, which was this mask slash helmet hooked up to an oxygen tank that would um, basically allow him to focus his attention on only one thing at a time, because he felt in 1925 that there were too many things demanding his attention and he needed to focus. So there's, there's sort of echoes in the past of the situation we're in now. And then, of course, I was also thinking about popular culture um, and masks in the way that, you know, masks were once the disguise for the villain. And now they're sort of the necessary protective gear for the hero, right? All the superhero um, movies that we're seeing in theaters or not in theaters, as, as the case may be, you know, it's, it's often the heroes and the heroines who are wearing masks to disguise themselves. And that's an interesting cultural change. But as it turns out, um, I didn't share an article about masks. And in fact, I was thinking I shared an article about what masks are supposed to enable us to do, and that is to breathe. And um, the current situation, if you're with someone else, if you're outside or inside with someone else, you're supposed to wear a mask or else you shouldn't be breathing because to breathe could potentially kill you, just like breathing in the trenches in World War I could potentially kill you if you did it without a mask. And so I shared this um, interesting uh, science article from 2016 in which a group of scientists, German scientists went into the movie theater, went into a few movie theaters and measured the volatile uh, compounds, the volatile organic compounds that were circulating through the theater to see if they could figure out if there was some sort of relationship between the volatile organic compounds um, emitted by the audience and scenes um, shown on the screen. And um, they would continuously monitor the chemicals in the air through the ventilation system so that they could time it with particular scenes and films. 
Um, and you can imagine sort of what their conclusion was, which is, of course, there is physiological reaction to what we see and hear in the movie theater. We've all experienced this. We've all felt it. It can, in fact, be measured um, uh, with a spectrometer and other scientific instruments that these volatile compounds um, occur in the air. Um, and they coded scenes in these films with labels like dream or sex or crying, crying and also dramas like, uh, or genres like comedy or mystery or drama. And what was interesting is that even though they did not find um, that these compounds were contagious, in other words, the um, compounds that I would produce when watching a, a funny scene in a film would not necessarily travel across the room and make someone else laugh. It wasn't that kind of thing. But that they could actually predict if there is going to be a funny scene, we are going to see this kind of compound. And the two types of um, film scenes that were most closely associated with this predictability are two things that I imagine, again, like fires we'll be talking about um, within the hour, suspense and mm -hmm. comedy. And so the two, there are really two things about this um, study that interest me. One is it supports this theory, the, my theory, really, that, um, but a, a well-known theory that uh, audience and film co-create an atmosphere. Okay. That the invisible air around us, the atmosphere of the film, of the theater, actually affects the way that we see the film. Um, it is created through the interaction of the film and the audience. Um, spectatorship, therefore, is not just ocular, it's not just auditory, nor is it embodied in the strict sense. It exceeds the visual, it exceeds the oral, and it, might, and it exceeds even what we might call corporal kinetics. It's not just about like jumping up in your seat or sitting rigid or laughing and moving your body. Um, and the, the other thing that interests me is that these two very predictable, very strong connections, comedy and suspense are linked according to the authors with heightened anxiety. And it seems to me that if, the, if we have a label for the current structure of feeling, it's heightened anxiety. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think it's the kind of affective atmosphere of the theater and the classroom and embodied spaces that I miss most. But seriously, everyone should read this article that Stephen links to. It's not often that you get a chance to think about like the chemicals you emit with your breath while watching some of, what are some of the like cloudy with a chance of meatballs too, or like suck at Shakespeare. <laughs> Um, anyway, so uh, the article I chose, it's a think piece that I wrote last spring for the Los Angeles Review of Books, and I was kind of writing it and revising it throughout the early months of the pandemic. It's called Cinema's First Epidemic from Contagious Twitching to Convulsive Laughter, and it's about both um, the thematization of Contagious contagious pandemics in early cinema and silent cinema, um, and also how those on-screen representations intersected with um, the closure of theaters or the threatening of the film industry's livelihood and ticket revenue um, by outbreaks, not just of the flu, uh, but polio, rubella, typhoid, cholera, measles, yellow fever, and so forth. Um, and I actually, so I was writing an initial draft of this piece in early March while kind of deliberating over whether to finish the draft, finish the first draft, uh, or put it down and um, follow through on a previously scheduled spring break trip to Las Vegas. And this was March 7th, and I'm really happy to say that I closed my laptop and went to Las Vegas and right, <laughs> was like eating at um, a hotel buffet in Vegas on March 8th. And that was the last time I left the state of Minnesota. And four days later, we were in um, home lockdown and started quarantining on March 11th. Um, and so in the article, I was thinking again about the kinds of pandemic representations that we were turning to also in the early months of COVID. So like how in March, Steven Soderbergh's 2011 film Contagion shot up from like 270th to the second most watched film in the Warner Brothers archive. And I was really fascinated by why we turn to images that magnify um, the very things that we're extremely anxious about and whether or not those images aren't more triggering than they are therapeutic. 
Um, so what's the line between anxiety and enjoyment when it comes to the spectacle of bodily contagion? That's kind of a key question of my article. And I don't think it's become any less interesting since March 2020, let alone since like 1904. So the thing about these early film representations of contagious pandemics, they were overwhelmingly comedic, right? They're not sort of associated with the pathos of disease, but they had titles like laughing gas, the yawner, um, cayenne pepper in a streetcar, the matrimonial epidemic. So it's about the kind of visual sight gag of when an ordinary um, tick or gesture like yawning, laughing, sneezing, itching um, becomes uh, not just kind of a corporeal catastrophe for the, you know, the person exhibiting those symptoms, but irresistibly contagious and suggestible to everyone around them. So I think about that, we might think about that too. How do we turn to therapeutic images of contagious transmission? Um, to engage with in a variety of ways, both as a source of therapeutic relief, but maybe just like further madness and obsession, the kind of unknowable germ that, that you know, is disrupting our lives in all of these, you know, catastrophic ways. Um, and I mentioned, and I can talk about this a little bit more later, how these on-screen representations intersected with the history of how actual pandemics and disease outbreaks disrupted the industry, but actually by the time we get to the flu pandemic of 1918, the film industry already had a playbook for how to respond when public health mandates were trying to close down the theaters. And this is super interesting to me, how affect itself, and not least of all, laughter, joy, fun, happiness, were kind of weaponized against um, public health re regulation. And there's this quote from Moving Picture World in 1918, um, laughter is the most powerful cure for a disease and happiness is more contagious than any epidemic. And I think, you know, we're still seeing laughter and like, you know, fun weaponized in that way in this kind of battle royale between the good of the economy and the health of the public. So it's, those are a lot of the resonances I had in mind when I was writing that piece. Yeah, so the piece that I chose to share is an article that I wrote in the uh, formerly named Cinema Journal that was published a couple of years ago. I think it was in 2018, and it was. And now I will I will confirm that Stephen has the gift of foresight. Uh, it's about fires, and it's about fires in film studios. And really, the resonance for me was thinking back to a period in the 1920s in the wake of the uh, the influenza epidemic of 1918-1919 of a period in which risk remained really, uh, really at the forefront of, of, of the experience of working in a film studio. Uh, in 1918, film studios often closed, and we may come back to this with further details, but a lot of the studios closed, or at least sort of closed for parts of the, of the shutdown. And this was a kind of a really distinct difference between how it worked in film theaters during this period. There may have been this playbook for the, for the theaters, but the playbook was a little bit, I'd say, more complicated for the studios. Uh, where profit motive tended to, to, to trump uh, actual closure or at least paying the workers, right? Some people were given uh, unpaid vacation, if you want to call it a vacation, during the 1918 pandemic. But in any case, the resonance for me was that um, in the, by the end of the 1920s, despite whatever measures might have been put in place to protect people, uh, the risk of fire in particular remained a really dramatic risk in film studio work. If you're a film historian, and I know many of the people in the audience are, you're of course really familiar with the history of fires in film theaters. Um, and the fires in film studios, I think we, we used to know a little bit less about, but they were really risky. And so the fire, fire I wrote about happened in New York in 1929, and it killed 10 people who worked in the studio. Four of them were actresses performing on the stage at the time. Uh, the other six were all studio workers. There was a, a makeup person, a few electricians, a bookkeeper, uh, an accountant, right, who all lost their lives because of this fire. And one of the things that we find out is that the studios uh, as, as institutions, not as places, but the institutions, the studios, uh, who took their names from these buildings were really invested in not changing their working practices in order to protect the workers and in in fact trying their very best to try to uh, uh, make these kinds of problems disappear at least from the public imagination and so you know my interest is kind of like Jocelyn's, I think she put it so well a few minutes ago, showing those seams of what happens invisibly behind the scenes of the media that we consume. And one of those seams is risk and danger. And so um, 
one last thing I'll just say about it for now, and, and, and maybe we'll come back to it later, is that, you know, I was really struck when I wrote the, that piece about 1929, and I was struck again thinking about this roundtable by something that the historian and historian of technology, Lewis Mumford, said about uh, what makes the modern period modern. And, and, and his point was that um, part of what we should understand as modernity is the care for life. And, 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 and the kind of need to protect people and take care of people. And that in earlier era, uh, that didn't matter so much. And people could be left to, to die in tenements. People could be left uh, to, to become ill, uh, to, to not be able to work. Uh, but that to be modern was to take care of these people. Uh, and I think that the question of whether or not we've fulfilled that remains really strong today uh, as we look at the response to the pandemic that's happening right now. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I see we're coming up on the first half hour and we're only on question one. So, um, <laughs> um, so maybe shorter answers, but the, 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 the setup that you've done that was really important, I think, and, and just for the audience and for the panelists, I mean, in thinking about how to do an interesting webinar um, in the pandemic like we're doing right now, um, we needed to have a shared sense of documents, a shared sense of what people were thinking. So that was the reason to ask for it, just as a kind of kicking off point. So I want to address uh, the first question to Maggie, although others are, are welcome to, uh, to add as well. And, and in a way, I'm following on from what you already described a minute ago. Um, in, that, in the article that you, you wrote for the LA Review of Books and that you appended um, to our webinar, uh, you write, and I quote, even before the 1918 influenza plague, Recurring waves of illness repeatedly threatened the livelihood of filmmakers and exhibitors. Polio bedeviled the industry from 1912 until long after the 1918 flu outbreak. Children under 16 were even banned from going to the movies, end quote. So could you say more about, you've already sketched out a longer, or your interest in contagion in film history, but the longer history of contagion, because part of the conceit of a panel called 1920-2020 is that there's some, some equivalency, but in fact, what your very brief article suggested was this concern, you know, movies are dangerous places that was there from the very start. So please, Maggie. Thank you so much for that question, Patrice. I'll try to be brief. Um, we're all a <laughs> bunch of talkers. We're all a bunch of kibitzers. <laughs> Not to go on for too long. Um, yeah, I mean, and you've already given a couple of examples in your question. We've talked about this. Um, first of all, I want to say it is wild to do keyword searches for epidemics in Lantern, because in like the same issue of Moving Picture World, you'll get, you know, scarlet fever outbreak closes down all theaters in, or, you know, a bunch of theaters in Chicago in 1906. And then like this mother-in-law themed comedy is a raging epidemic of fun and happiness for everyone who watches it. So it's like, you know, that's always the sort of archival happenstance of digitized keyword searches. Um, um, so all of these themes were kind of being um, explored in promiscuous, often perverse ways on the level of representation. Uh, but yeah, polio, I'd say, prior to the influenza outbreak in 1918, 1919, which was by far the most disruptive and national in scale in terms of the kind of crisis it posed for theater um, managers and the, the film industry. Um, children under 16 or 15 were banned on a regional level and on a temporary basis. So um, uh, theaters in uh, Omaha had um, you know, just reopened from a polio motivated closure um, when they were again forced to, to shutter in, in October um, 19, 1918. Uh, from 1912 onward, polio was kind of like the major epidemic devil of um, uh, film ticket sales. Scarlet fever outbreaks in uh, Chicago in 1906, New York in 1907, Ohio in 1910, um, in Omaha, Nebraska in 1916, um, uh, local exhibitors won uh, an appeal uh, against um, a public health mandate to remain closed, a case that almost went to the Supreme Court. So I want, you know, I have like a laundry list of these cases that I've very carefully and laboriously compiled from, from Lantern, but I won't bore everyone with, you know, the, the minutiae because I know we have juicier terrain to get to. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about public spaces, entertainment spaces, and questions of risk and labor that we've already um, have been introduced. So how have film theaters mitigated the risks that viewers encountered as a result of public health and other crises? Uh, Jocelyn, I'm, you've recently written about a reign of terror in the early 1930s US theaters as a result of union bombings. You say that the movies are risky and have always been so. Can you say more about this and the tensions between mitigation and labor? Yeah, absolutely. I've Wow, I've been completely entranced by this uh, story of what essentially was racketeering in uh, the early 1930s, particularly in 19, uh, end of 1931 until uh, about middle 1933. Uh, Gerald Horn and David Whitmer have written about this uh, to a certain extent, but it's, it's just a really fascinating story. And it's the story about how um, prohibition was about to end. And so mobsters uh, primarily, you know, overseen by Al Capone and other uh, rum runners in Chicago realized their profit streams were about to dry up. So uh, they kind of leaped onto the bandwagon of infiltrating uh, the IATSE, the International Association of Theater and Stage Employees. Um, it's just so utterly wild to me now. This is one of those, you know, wonderful things. I was not researching this at all. I was uh, looking into prohibitions effects on um, the exhibition industry, um, but this was a really fascinating kind Kind of um, tangent that I've been thinking about. But what really struck me in reading this was um, how many people were injured or killed. And those include a janitor who was killed at the Low Midland in Kansas City. Um, Kansas City was a hotbed of this crime. I mean, Kansas City was just like an amazing hotbed in the 1920s and early 1930s in general. I'm completely, it is the first place I'm going when the pandemic is over, Kansas City. Um, but <laughs> it's a wonderful, exotic Kansas City. Um, but what really struck me about this was, well, this poor janitor just found a time bomb, a really shoddy time bomb, because clearly mobsters aren't good at building bombs. So like they don't even go off at the right time. This janitor dis discovers it, it goes off and he's killed, right? He's killed. Um, and you, we never know what his name is. He's just one of the people that was killed in these uh, spate of bombings. And what really struck me about that was how we're also facing, you know, the threat of, um, well, of disease in the movie theater now, right? It's like a different kind of threat. It's the threat of contagious disease. Um, but the people that we're concerned about getting sick in the theater are spectators. And there's an another there's another kind of class of people that are at work in the movie theater. And those are, of course, um, the movie theater workers. So I just see a kind of um, an interesting parallel and a really disturbing parallel that we still have risk affixed to spectators, as opposed to all the other laboring bodies that are in operation in the movie theater. Um, and it just made me think about, you know, should we, should we define movie theater workers as frontline workers in some way, right? Why are we expecting them to put their lives at risk? And why are we only attending to um, the spectators risks uh, who are entering and paying uh, for their movies? And I think that's really the answer to it. Mm, yeah. Um, okay, so each of you have written about cinema as a practice and a discourse that exceeds the screen and the image. Um, can you tell us more about debates over gender, race, physicality, safety, pleasure, one or more of those um, out of the frame and embedded in other institutions such as the penal system, travel, insurance, or public health? Stephen, I think this is a question I direct to you. Yeah. Um... There are so many stories about in-flight entertainment and safety. I, I almost don't know which one to tell. There, I've got a whole chapter in my book about um, in-flight entertainment systems that cause fires on airplanes and subsequently cause emergency landings or even crashes. There was an incident where um, the American Airlines used to have a system where there was a camera attached to the nose of the airplane and um, you, passengers could watch the airplane take off and land um, from the like the pilot's eye view, um, but a plane crash shortly after takeoff. So there's all this speculation about um, passengers watching their own death. Um, so I think the story I'm going to choose though is is one that's about um, safety and travel and the institution of in-flight entertainment that's sort of revealing in what, um, in maybe thinking more about morals and censorship. In, um, when TWA first started showing airplanes and or started showing movies in airplanes in the 60s, 
um, one of the, the difficulties it faced was that in the, cock, in the fuselage, you have a general audience, you have adults and children. And so what sorts of films can you show? And basically they said, we will only show films that have been approved by Parents Magazine and the Catholic Legion of Decency. Somehow, um, Alfred Hitchcock's Birds got approved on both those lists. And because it was approved, it automatically got on the slate for TWA. So you can imagine this was back in the day where there was a um, single projector, single screen at the front of the cabin. Everybody was strapped in and they basically could not avoid watching the film, even if you didn't buy the headphones and listen, There's there were the images on the screen. So you can imagine hundreds of people being forced to watch the birds while they're like, caught in the airplane flying around in nowhere to go. This led to all sorts of complaints um, about being a captive audience, about not feeling safe, about anxiety, about um, horror, all of these things. And eventually from there led to um, further and further um, experiments within the airplane to try and make it so that everyone could watch their own film and there wasn't a shared screen. So that project really began um, in the late 60s, early 70s and carried through to the seatback screen in 1998. So you have basically this, this notion of um, censorship and feeling like, oh, well, these films are safe because because Parents Magazine approved them, but they are really in this particular context dangerous. And that um, then um, leads to changes in um, spectatorship and exhibition. So just as a brief follow-up, Stephen, um, since you've written so compellingly about affect and film reception, and one thing that we're thinking about here, of course, you know, we have a campus theater, it's wonderful, wish you were there, wish we were all there. Mm -hmm. um, but we try to think about, you know, how do we think about, you know, anxieties and fears and affect and reception, both in the past and today? I mean, you, your article does talk about how, diff you know, what, what yeah. your uh, airplane is looking forward to modes of modes of viewing and listening um, today. Um, but when we think about the possibilities inherent to coming together as a group, what does that imply for all for questions about affect and fear? I mean, why are we going to get people to come back to a movie theater? I, I have so many yeah thoughts on this. When, it, when I was thinking about going back to the movie theater and anxiety and fear, I thought about um, you know the James Holmes and Aurora shooting yeah. and you know, how, you know, for a while it was really difficult to go into a movie theater and think about like, you know, this, this is a scene, this is potentially a scene of a mass shooting, you know, 82 people were shot um, in that. I thought about the time where I was physically assaulted in a movie theater by someone who it turns out was on parole um, for armed kidnapping um, and how you don't know who those strangers are sitting next to you in the uh, darkened room. Um, but you know, those are in some ways exceptional uh, incidents. And uh, the airplane is actually sort of a good metaphor for what we're on, the journey we're on now, which is we're sort of on the suspenseful and anxious, you know, uh, experience where we think, well, someday it will end, someday we'll land, we'll land safely. And hopefully the pilots and the crew will help us enough so that we can land, we can continue to breathe, um, we can go outside, right, <laughs> and enjoy the sunshine. Um, and in that situation, often the screened entertainments are a form of reassurance, and people will actively seek out material that they already know, that they're already familiar with, or material that they know will offer a resolution or a happy ending. You know, maybe part of the reason why Contagion was such a popular film um, in that moment was because people might think, oh, we'll figure out how to solve this problem or there will be a happy ending or you know the the hero will rush in and the contagion will be cured and that's how it's going to happen in real life um, and i often think about the films that people watch on airplanes you know romantic comedies light action films these sorts of things where you know there is a happy ending the, it is predictable um, they're often familiar um, they're films that maybe we thought we would see in a 
in the actual movie theater and pay $15 for, but we never got around to, and we're happy they're, they're on the menu um, on, the, on the airplane. So I think that, you know, there's, there's two ways. One is to sort of like lean into the fear and anxiety and never go back to the movie theater, right? Which is sort of like the, the emotional place I'm in now. But there's also the, the therapeutic, as, as Maggie was referring to, the, the way in which screened entertainments can operate as therapy and help ease us back into um, physical co-presence and forms of collectivity um, that might sort of uh, lead to solidarity and, and some sort of um, like a better future, a better tomorrow to name drop yet another film. <laughs> well, another invisible force that underlies cinema spaces of encounter counter is that of energies. And Brian, this is for you. You've written about natural resources in cinema. In a moment of ecological crisis, um, as well as a health pandemic, how should we understand the environmental impact of movie going and filmmaking, both in the past and today? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a way in which this threatens to like spin way off away from our conversation about the pandemic. So I'll try not to let it do so. But I thought, you know, maybe there would be two ways to answer this question that end up, I think, becoming one answer. One way is to um, to, to recognize that, you know, many people have drawn an analogy between uh, the crisis that is climate change and global warming and the crisis that is the pandemic. And I think that there are real problems with that analogy, but what they do signal is that in both cases, what we have is uh, um, a, um, a situation in which the risk of these things is, is uh, radically unequal, right? And there certain kinds of people are at much greater risk than other kinds of people. And one of the things that we can, uh, that, that we can think, you know, these things together through is thinking about how to mitigate risk and the way to mitigate risk uh, happens long before these dangerous things happen. Uh, it happens in creating a more equal society, to put it in a re rather banal, but I think correct way. Um, and so that would be one way to, th to, to kind of answer your question. But I think the other way to draw it back to cinema is that if we think about cinema from the perspective, not so much of, uh, of, of Hollywood and theatrical feature films, but rather from the perspective of other kinds of movies, things like non-theatrical media would be the term we use often in our field, but also things like commercials and propaganda. You know, we see a much longer history of cinema's a deep, deep, deep imbrication in the propagation of, of, of risk uh, through climate change. Uh, and the thing that interests me the most about that, the way my research tackles this is by thinking about movies made in particular by oil companies. Um, and oil companies have a deep, deep interest in the cinema, uh, if you can imagine, um, and have made so many movies, so many movies that have taught us a way of living in the world, a way way of understanding what the world should be uh, that is, you know, that is deeply influential on the, on the climate change crisis that we face. And so I think one thing we have to do as scholars is to be attentive to this world of cinema. Uh, and I know many people in this audience uh, are doing that. I mean, the last thing to say, and this really ties these two together, is that there's a lot of excellent work, and I could name drop lots of people who are writing about the close links between uh, the media industry and climate change, because of course, uh, just to name one industry, Hollywood, Hollywood is a major emitter uh, of greenhouse uh, gases. And so, you know, we need to be conscious of the film industry's role in creating climate change. Um, and, um, and, you know, there are certain things that Hollywood has done to, to, to try to make itself more green, uh, some better than others. But I think that's a much longer conversation that I don't want to, to take too far for now. So let's talk about the longer history of the transformation of the movie theater and its spectator. You know, Brian, you have written about studios before the studio system and the architecture of cinematic spaces in early cinema. Maggie, you've also written about early cinema and representations of bodily contagion. Finally, both Jocelyn and Stephen explore exhibition histories from the 1920s onwards. Can each of you say something about the transformations you've written about whether in the US or abroad, whether in the film theater or other spaces. Um, maybe also how those transformations tell us something about the constellations of spectatorship we see now. Yeah, uh, my, my work really does focus on uh, the transformation of the spectator over time, uh, the cinephilic spectator, um, 
but especially the ideal spectator in terms of how exhibition conceived of this spectator. So um, in my first book, I wrote about um, how the movie theater became a space that the American movie theater, I should specify, became a space that was really emptied of decoration and how that then resulted in a new way of controlling and regulating the spectator. Um, I think it is actually important to attend to that. I'll return to this theme that I've kind of been um, circling around today, the idea of showing the seams, right? Of what has seemed seamless. And now we're really used to going into a movie theater and it, it's we're very used to it being empty and not full of the kind of decor that you would see in a movie palace or something like that. Um, but those aspects of invisible style have a history. They have, um, they, they didn't like spring out of nowhere, right? They're not natural. Um, and understanding their history enables us to understand the ideologies that helped construct them and also enables us to understand uh, how industry and really therefore um, American capitalism as well has conceived of all of us as spectators. And that really provides insight into um, how we understand our ways moving forward as, you know, as, as, as ocular uh, citizens of the United States. So I can piggyback off of that um, super evocative uh, answer just because early cinema was such an embodied space, right? Before the formation of the kind of implied spectator who's positioned by um, the gaze of the film as text, right? Early cinema, there were no dedicated movie theaters until around 1905 with the Nickelodeon boom. Um, and early cinema was everywhere, um, right? At the fairgrounds, the circus, church, traveling shows, uh, community clubs. Um, it simultaneously kind of permeated and transformed a variety of institutions going back to your earlier question, Patrice, about the relationship between cinema, cinema as industry or discourse versus cinema as kind of inframed aesthetic image. And I think like, this transitional period in cinema from like the mid 19 aughts through the 19 teens has always fascinated me because cinema as an institution is becoming sort of decorporealized, right? If the early film spectator would maybe turn around away from the image itself to marvel at the projector, right? It was an incredibly embodied space. And that was sort of the locus of its affective politics, the way in which Miriam Hansen talks about early cinema as an alternative public sphere for bringing together all of these sort of isolated communities through their experience of this new medium. Um, the transitional film spectator was becoming increasingly disembodied. Um, so these transitional films um, uh, frequently thematize images of like female metamorphosis, limb dismemberment, and so many other bizarre experimental images of bodily self-rupture. And that's always been super fascinating to me. I'm um, speaking about the kind of labor politics of care work and social reproduction that have come to a crisis during the pandemic. There was a really popular uh, spate of kitchen maid themed comedies where the kitchen maid would dismember her limbs to finish her housework on time. Um, this one film I was just watching earlier for the Nasty Women set is called the nursemaid strike and you know the women who care for other people's children go on strike they attach like a rubber hose to a cow udder to feed the babies the older children stage a counter protest and i'm kind of thinking you know it's like i think it was sort of mocking the suffragette movement and labor politics labor protest at the time but i find la greve de nourice incredibly empowering to watch today because i think we actually need um uh, I, I don't, a general strike of reproductive care work that is, you know, kind of too often been made invisible and, you know, we just, we just keep bending to accommodate all of the unresolvable contradictions that the pandemic has exacerbated, but yeah, maybe we need more um, early film style made strikes. Those are my two cents. Thanks. So Stephen or Brian, Brian. I'll go ahead and jump in. There's a question in the Q&A that I think this is an opportune time to answer, which is about whether or not their uh, theater, America, or whether or not movie theaters are planning to update their HVAC systems. 
And I think the answer is maybe. <laughs> I think that there have been some, uh, some, some negotiations and some guidelines developed that suggest that the current HVAC systems must be in working order if they're going to be open, but I don't know if that is, is, is quite uh, what it takes. Uh, but one place where we do know that HVAC systems are really um, being considered is in movie studios again. And one of the things that really fascinates me is that actually in some ways, you know, things haven't changed very much from early cinema in terms of studios. Technologies, of course, have changed quite radically, right? No longer are people making movies in, you know, greenhouse style uh, open spaces as they were in 1900. Uh, but nonetheless, the basic ambition of the film studio remains the same. It is a place that is defined by a desire for environmental control, right? Mm -hmm. Extreme environmental management in order to create a, an environment that is perfect cre for creating other environments. That hasn't really changed at all. But one of the things that the pandemic has thrown into, into relief is how that ambition to control the environment must also include air quality control. And so one of the things that we've seen um, in, 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 in LA and also in places like Georgia where a lot of filming is taking place is that studios have updated their HVAC systems with the ambition of filtering out uh, more virus, uh, if possible, in order to create air that is safer to breathe, and that has really struck me as one of as one of the things that um, is really interesting about how the studio might change as a result of the pandemic. But in many ways, the studio hasn't changed at all. Right? It retains this ambition to control the world in order to create uh, new kinds of worlds. Mm -hmm. Stephen, yeah. yeah, I'll just jump in there because what Brian was saying reminded me that in some ways the safest movie theater right now is the airplane because so many airlines have upgraded their um, HVAC systems, their circulation, they go through with those UV robots to um, blast everything. So um, there is a way and because of the mixed lighting, it's not completely darkened. You can actually see if somebody's wearing a mask or not. Um, of course, that's mitigated against, you know, every day there's another air rage story and another person who refuses to put on a mask or refuses to deplane or, you know, these kinds of things. But in some ways, um, the, the control of the air and the literal air conditioning is, you know, exactly what we need to be thinking about um, here. And that goes back to what Maggie was saying about childcare workers, you know, so many um, school teachers who are being pressured by parents, by legislators, by pundits to go back to schools where there are no working windows. In some cases, particularly here in Seattle, where air conditioning is just not a thing. It's, it's different than say Phoenix, Arizona, where air conditioning is sort of built into everything. Um, there is no way to circulate the air in some of these classrooms. And um, I think that that's something that partly because it's invisible, but partly because it's just um, a taken for granted that we don't really think too much about the air we breathe. Um, that's something that really should be addressed. Well, to end um, with the last question, then we'll open up for some questions from the audience that, and I'll ask Tyler to uh, join us uh, at that point, but not quite yet for the last question. I think this is a really important question uh, for everyone. So it's a foundational question. I mean, what can be gained and what are the pitfalls of making historical comparisons, such as 1920, 2020? Um, what can be gained and what's lost or obscured in such comparisons? I mean, I was thinking when Arnold Schwarzenegger came out with his public service announcement comparing uh, the January 6th insurrection to Kristallnacht, I thought, what makes you think this is 1938? This might be 1923. This is the beer hall push. This is, you know, this is the beginning, not this, you know. So in your own work, how have you navigated, um, you know, archival research and pressing theoretical questions? I mean, what's the point of writing history now? And I want you to really reflect on the, the conceit. I mean, it's both interesting, but as Brian, as you were just saying, nothing really has changed fundamentally. I mean, one of the things that really struck me is in trying to make sense of how the movie industry is operating right now, I found it useful to go back and think about 1918 as a point of reference, not as the point of reference necessarily, but as one point of reference that might be useful. And I found it really striking that, um, you know, that it, that how similar it is that in 19, January 1919, you can read in the moving picture, new, motion, motion picture news, I think is the name, uh, and find out that not a single studio in LA uh, does not have at least one or more people who are out with the flu, 
right? And yet the studios are still operating. And we see this happening still today. I mean, and this goes back to that uh, a point that Jocelyn made earlier about essential workers and who gets counted as an essential worker. Here in California, movie, uh, the movie crews are essential workers as designated by the governor, uh, but that hasn't meant that they aren't in great danger. And, you know, it's, it's been really amazing to watch uh, how many coronavirus outbreaks there have been on movie sets, just like there were back in 1918 and 1919. And, you know, if you're a fan of, of lots of shows that you want to watch at home, the one that is most kind of reflexive here in LA would be uh, Mr. Mayor, right, of, where Ted Danson plays the mayor of Los Angeles. That show has been shut down by coronavirus outbreaks on set. And there are many, many others that have been um, and there's a real fight. And the other point, and then I'll, then I'll stop, but the other point that really struck me is um, looking back at some of the real resistance to shutting down the industry within the industry, right? People want to work, right? People need to work, they need to get paid. Uh, and the most striking I found was a poem from November 2nd, night, published on November 2nd, 1918, that refers to the local health board as the H-E-L-L-T-H board, right? The hell health board, right? Because they don't want the health board to tell them what they can do and what they can't do. And one of the things that we've definitely seen here in LA are a lot of industry workers who don't want the governor to tell them that they can't go to work. Um, you know, and I think behind this is a shared problem from 1918, 1919 and, and, and 2020, which is that these people need to be paid uh, and that we, we need their content, uh, but we also need them to be safe. And if they can't go to work, they should still be able to earn a living wage. And in 1919, people were made to take time off work by Fox Studios without pay. And in 2020, if if people can't work, they don't get paid. And I think that that you know that problem is the lasting problem that we need to address. Yeah, I I get so excited listening to what you're saying, Brian, um, and really to what everybody's saying too. It, it, this is, it's just like so much fodder for um, for great uh, great thoughts about this. And I too was have been so struck by reading about the resistance to um, exhibitors, right, to theater owners in 1918 about the government coming and shutting the theater down. Like you can't tell us what to do. We don't want to listen to you. Whatever. And so this notion that this is all sprung up as a result of like Trumpism or whatever. No. Oh, it is it is in the bones of American society and our relationship, uh, the relationships between um, political ideologies and um, and capital ideologies, right? Like those are those have been enmeshed for you know for a very 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 long time. But the other thing that it makes me uh, think of is how. Um, how the theater has continually been the icon of normalcy. Right, like if we can, we'll know we're back to normal if we're back in the theaters, and that's the way it was positioned after um, after the influenza pandemic too, and that's the way it's positioned now. Right, there's something about the movie theater and that part the particular form of escapism that the movie theater and movies together signify that equals uh, normal American society. What it, normal American society in some ways, and I think um, excavating why exactly that is the case is going to be really fruitful in the coming years. I worry a lot about what's going to happen to um, small independent theaters, uh, rep cinemas. I mean, if there's one takeaway from the flu pandemic and theater closures is that it was catastrophic for um, small theater owners. Um, and, you know, it just consolidated ownership more, even more in the hands of the large capitalist industry. And I've heard stories about like um, the Seattle Film Forum being used as a space of refuge for Black Lives Matter protesters over the summer who were being gassed by police. So repurposing the film theater as a kind of community space, um, uh, even a safe space kind of in the interregnum between pandemic catastrophe and whatever, you know, um, bouquet of future catastrophe is to uh, follow from it. But Patrice, I'm so glad you mentioned the Nazi beer hall putsch because I literally had it in my notes. I mean, right, it was a total farce at the time. Everyone was laughing. And I think the um, comparisons of the capital insurrection or putsch or, you know, low key coup or whatever we want to call it to the, you know, Nazi beer hall putsch are really, um, uh, apt and you know sometimes um, it's farcical laughter that um, 
you know, forebodes the catastrophe to come. So I think a lot, like for me, these comparisons between 1920 or 1904, whenever, and the present moment, it's not so much about like asserting a presentist frame on the archive or like finding the example that we can analogize to the future that's otherwise uncertain or unknowable, but about engaging with the speculative possibilities of the present moment, what's the very slim opportunities that might in fact be an opening through a kind of close archival research of the unrealized or sort of briefly realized alternatives of the past. That's where it's at for me in the archive. And it always emerges through the dialectic between uh, joyful laughter and affective anxiety and how that sort of ambivalence is exchanged between bodies in spaces ranging from like, right, Black Lives Matter protests over the summer, I feel like that was the first time the left came together in physical proximity since the start of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, to like right, liberate protests, which are just more on the side of mob hysteria. So we'll see. It's probably not going to work out well, but who knows. And Stephen. Wow, I don't even know if I can follow um, such eloquent answers up. I feel like it's just going to you're ending with me, it's going to go badly. Um, so I guess I, I want to talk a little bit about writing history because, um, you know, part of your question, Patrice, was about why write history now. And, you know, I asked myself that because writing for me is so painful and it's such a struggle. But the research, um, you know, what Maggie was talking about, there is this joy, you know, um, and there is this sense that history is just this this resource um, of like what Raymond Williams would maybe phrase it as like a resource of hope, right? Um, and I was reading um, Jean-Paul Sartre and what he has to say about radio back in the 60s. And he's, he's writing about, you know, the serial relationship of the radio listener to the voice on the radio. And then later on in these unpublished notes, he, he writes about television in the same way. And so I'm trying to integrate this into my current book project. And then after he's writing about the later, the radio, he goes on this long description of the great fear of 1789 and how the social relations in the great fear of 1789 and the contagion of that fear are analogous to the um, social relations of listening to the radio or watching television. And that is not a connection I would have made. And that is just, it's sort of a wonderful way to think about how um, media devices, media technologies arrange bodies in um, particular ways, which then affect social relationships and affect the way that messages are communicated and um, you know, forms of contagion that stretches back hundreds of years. I never would have gone back to 1789 um, otherwise. And that's one of the joys of researching history, even if writing this chapter on um, the critique of dialectical reason and television is one of my more painful experiences as a scholar. But doing the research was just great. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks, everyone. I, I, I want to take, um... I want to invite Tyler Morgan Stern. He's a PhD student here and uh, works. He's a graduate researcher at the center, and he's been following the questions. And we'll select a few um, as we round out the end of our roundtable. Right. Thank you, Patrice. And yeah, I've selected a few questions here. We're a little short on time, so we won't be able to get to all of them. But there's a few of them that I think um, raise some important questions that come up across your various comments. So. Um, Sangeeta Gopal um, raises the question of race and the question of race in these discussions of sort of vulnerability of especially um, audiences, but also um, essential workers. So the current pandemic has, of course, been characterized by stark racial disparities. Um, infection rates are far higher among people of color, while rates of vaccination and access to medical services are markedly lower among those same populations. Um, in your respective research on this sort of 1918-1920 period, do you notice similarly sort of racialized patterns of risk and exposure and vulnerability um, in your work? Yeah, I, um, I don't typically research um, contagion and disease and so on, but I'll, I'll take this in a, a slightly, uh, I'll take this in the direction that I've kind of been uh, talking about today. Um, in a lot of my work, you know, what, when I look at uh, discussions of exhibition from the, basically about the early 1930s until the 1950s, the default spectator is always white. 
right? That's what you just have to assume that exhibitors are saying. Um, theaters, of course, are segregated around the country. There's different segregate. There's different um, laws of segregation in different parts of the country. Um, typically, it's just very municipal. It's uh, even theater by theater. Um, so you, we can't really make blanket statements about segregation. But much of the country did have um, segregated theaters, obviously prior to um, prior to the civil rights movement. Um, but one of the things that I found so interesting in doing this kind of research is that. Uh, you know, in segregated theaters, typically um, black audiences would be restricted to the balcony, right? Like if, if the theater is segregated and allows um, black audiences in, they're going to be restricted to the balcony. And that's because the balcony is right, like you can't see that well. Um, so as, as there's this move um, over the 1930s to transform the theater into a place that's kind of like a machine for seeing properly, um, very few uh, architects are focused on the sight lines in the balcony. They talk about sight lines and how we have to make sure that people can see properly, but they're not so concerned about the sight lines. And it's when I read about um, architects like Ben Schlanger, who um, I wrote about, um, when he talks about how important it is to think about the sight lines in the balcony, that's one of those moments moments that you can start to say, aha, I see that somebody, somebody is finally starting to think about what it means to have a segregated theater and what it means then to, uh, have, um, to have a different understanding of how optical technology might work across, um, across races, right, across the different kinds of audiences that are in the theater. So it's really a form of excavation and trying to find out, right, like trying to, to look with the eyes of a person in that time to understand how, um, how these, how these uh, different dynamics of audiences might have been working. So in the in the 1920s in the aviation industry in the United States, it was very dangerous. Um, there were a lot of airplane crashes and the commercial airline industry was trying to reassure people that air travel was safe. And to to follow up on this question about race, you know, this is also the time when we have in-flight entertainment being introduced on airplanes, 16 millimeter projectors um, on, uh, you know, THE flights. What does that stand for? Trans. Um, Atlantic or so, yeah, anyway, um, it later became Western Airlines, which is how I, I know of it um, in 1929. But the reason why we have um, white stewardesses on airplanes is because of reassurance that flights were safe. So they wanted nurses, trained nurses. They wanted young women who could act a motherly role and they wanted specifically white women because white women were also perceived as safe and docile. And they wanted to distinguish the very dangerous commercial aviation industry from the safer railway industry, which, of course, was serviced by black men, Pullman porters. So you have here um, in the 20s, you know, just as you would expect, you know, explicitly racist practices and hiring practices, but to protect whites and wealthy whites from the contagion of blackness and to prevent um, wealthy whites from coming into contact with the presumably dangerous black men in close contact in the airplane cabin. So yeah, I mean, I, my, my glib answer to this question is we live in a white supremacist society, you roll the dice, it's going to come up racism, it just doesn't matter, it's always coming up racism. So yeah, it's there, absolutely. All right. Um, following up on that, we have a couple of questions, one from Yiman Wang and one from an anonymous attendee, both of whom are interested in what happens to the role of cinema as a kind of public sphere or counter public sphere um, that you mentioned, Maggie, earlier. Um, under conditions of pandemic when our viewing is highly individuated, privatized, um, and confined to our living rooms for the most part. So how would this whole discussion of the venue and the affect of reception and of exhibition shift as exhibition becomes micro and individuated under the duress of the pandemic and condemnation, what will happen to the cinematic public sphere? Yeah, I thank you, Iman, that's a really, um, crucial question, and I worry about that all the time. I had jokingly contributed as to my materials for this, something I didn't realize was going to be added to the folder, um, which is a picture of my cat blocking the television screen while we're watching um, the film Mandy, which is just a bizarre film to bring up in this context for a number of reasons. Um, you know, so there are like little joyful disruptions, like, like you know, um, 
uh, interruptions by unforeseen bodies that can even make their way into one's domestic space. But um, I don't know, speaking to the article that Stephen assigned about the affective atmosphere that's created by the very chemicals that we breathe and that we laugh and that we sigh in the space of the theater, I do always hold out for that kind of utopian potentiality, no matter how unlikely, um, that's that's created by film exhibition culture. And there are ways that we can get that, get that or hold on to that kind of um, fantasy during the pandemic through social media discourse. I'm very plugged in to responses to Sundance on Twitter. Um, I, I've become addicted to Twitter probably for worse, but it is a kind of a way of staying plugged in to Right, one's, one's community, one's film community. And I think that this kind of deprivation has increased our hunger for the embodied spaces of film exhibition all the more. So assuming any of the theaters that survive, maybe because of the AMC meme stock, some of them will, <laughs> thanks be to Reddit. Um, but I don't know, the, the, the desire is not gonna go away as a result of the, the pandemic. The desire certainly won't. I hope the spaces themselves still exist or we can think of ways to rebuild them. I'll give the last question to uh, Bishnu Ghosh from here at UCSB, um, who follows up on Stephen, wants to follow up on Stephen's focus on atmosphere as the seam between the physicality of air as a medium of transmission, bad air, viral transmission, and air as a kind of social atmosphere or an affective matrix, something that contagion folds together. Does air as humidity or temperature, joy or danger figure in your archives or is it invisible? Well, it figures in my archives because I'm specifically looking for it. Um, you know, in one of the great changeovers from um, the kind of analog research I was performing as a graduate student to the digital keyword searching that, that Maggie talked about is that if you, you know, search for the word air or atmosphere, you get all sorts of unexpected results. Um, and that can lead to unexpected connections. I, I think for me, the importance of thinking about air, atmosphere, meteorology, and you know, I kind of want to hear from Brian about this as well, because I know he's written uh, about this, uh, is that it is un intangible and very difficult to explain to, to other people. I thought about, um, you know, with film atmosphere and affect, when uh, I saw The Phantom Menace in the movie theater when it first came out, and the sense of anticipation and joy in the crowd that carried over through the length of what is not a very good film in which fans later turned on. But at the time, everybody was just so excited for a new Star Wars film, it didn't really matter. And that fascinates me, that fascinates me that the air can change the way we receive a film. And I, and I mean that in, in the sense of that the questioner is using it as well, that it is both the, the literal chemicals in the air, but also the kind of exchange and contagion of feeling that is brought into the theater by the audience. Um, and some of my best memories of watching films in theaters are because the audience is so enthusiastic that it makes a terrible film or a mediocre film that much better. Right, that much more um, exciting and enjoyable. So Brian, you want to have the last word? Yeah, I mean, I will just say, you know, one thing that I would say uh, to Vishnu, it's a great question. And um, in some ways it's answered by something I said earlier about the kind of need, the, the kind of industry's desire to control the air. If you go way back to early cinema, you find that uh, that air is an important quality more for, for heat. And I think that the question mentions the possibility of heat or cold, but you know, but 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 I'll connect this back to the present. And maybe this will be my way to try to end. Um, but you know, that that it could be too hot, right, to work in some of these early filmmaking environments was a real problem. It had to be really bright, but of course it could be too hot. And then this will become a problem of studio lighting later on, and people being burned literally, right, by the by the lights. Um, but in the early period, one of the things it means is that certain kinds of film workers uh, can demand to not work in these places. And those are, of course, the celebrities, right? So celebrities didn't want to go out to Thomas Edison's laboratory and work there because they didn't want to have to go that far or because they didn't want to be cold in this uh, old, you know, in, in the original studio. They wanted to be able to stay in New York and have a more comfortable place. Now, the way we can draw, tie that back to the present and think of 
about the problem of air is to think about how Hollywood has tried to manage uh, the risk within within the film shoots that are going on right now in Los Angeles. And one of the ways they've done it is by defining the parts of the set according to zones, right? Zone A, zone B, zone C, right? And who is allowed to be in these different spaces, right? And zone A is where the celebrities are, not wearing their masks, right? Performing and at great risk. Now, if you're not too cynical, you'd say, well, of course it makes sense that this is a very protected area because it's the place where people can't wear PPE and where transmission can occur quite easily. If you're a little bit more cynical then what you can see is a spiraling out of risk from the center, the highest point of wealth and privilege in the film industry spiraling out to the people who are less and less privileged and those less and less privileged people Right, are more are 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 in these different zones, and they're subject to different rules of air and what one can breathe and who can be in one space. Uh, and that, for me, uh, is something that is very consistent across all of film history and really matters a lot. To, to, to it, it's something that we can see thanks to the pandemic in a way that maybe we couldn't see it as well before. Um, and I don't think that's being presentist, but rather uh, allowing the kind of present to illuminate the past. Uh, right in that kind of leap. Uh, that, that historians can, can make, um, and I will, I'll stop there. Okay, well, Brian, thank you. Stephen, thank you very much. Maggie, Jocelyn, thanks for helping me put this together. Um, thanks, everyone.